here. Um, she is a principal researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra. Born in Mozambique, she did her graduate studies in Russia at the St. Petersburg University and obtained her PhD in the USA at uh, Rutgers University. In Coimbra, at the CS, uh, Menezes develops several research projects and teaches in two different PhD programs that, uh, which deal with um, post-colonialism, global citizenship, and uh, human rights in the 21st century. Internationally, she also coordinates with Moventura de Sousa Santos and Karina um, Vidaseca. <laughs> A CS Claxo e learning course um, on epistemologies of the South. His, um, her research focuses on the political history and social legal complexity of Southern Africa, especially in Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa. At the heart of her interest are the relations between knowledge, power, and societies, paying special attention to people who uh, experience the violence of the colonial encounters. She has conducted various projects on the colonial legal pluralism um, with a focus on the relationship between the state and the traditional authorities and between official history, memories and other um, narratives of belonging in contemporary struggle. Another of her topics is the possibility of the colonization of the university, a theme that she has addressed particularly from her personal experience um, from her personal African experience. Res, uh, recent publications include a volume on epistemologies of the Global South in collaboration with, among others, with the Sousa Santos, as well as the book uh, Mozambique on the Move, Challenges and Reflection, in collaboration with Sheila Khan and Jörn Bertelsen. Today, she's going to talk about law and colonialism, challenges to sovereignty in the context of a struggle for the right to cognitive justice. So, thank you very much for being here. Um, buenos dias a todos y a todas. And I'm sorry I was asked to speak in English, so I'll switch to English because that was the request I had. Okay. I <laughs> and I'll try to. Ex I, I was asked, so. Um, I, I will explain, and I, I really would like to thank for the invitation and especially for the challenge to talk to you about common problems that I think we share. And I'll start from my own experience, from the experience in my region, Eastern Africa, the Indian Ocean, which is not Atlantic, it's another thing. But I think the learning process we all went through are bridges to decolonize knowledge, to decolonize ourselves, and above all to decolonize the political structures we still live in. The second moment I want to address is to pay my respect, and I think it's a duty of memory, uh, to several countries and several people from Latin America that really supported Mozambique in the initial stage when we became independent. We became independent 44 years ago, so we are a very recent country. I was born in a colony, so for me colonialism is not memory, it's a lived experience. And when Mozambique became independent, the Portuguese left within two or three years. So all the administrative structure of the state was left. And for some strange reason, those accidents, weird accidents in history, uh, there were a lot of political exiles from Chile, from Brazil, and from Argentina that came to the rescue. So I really thank very much the people from Chile, Mozambique, from Chile, from Brazil, and from Argentina, that were part of the government, for example, of Allende, that came and worked, and for me became the real the reference of what solidarity means, because they came, they lived with us, in the same conditions as we lived, sometimes sharing airplanes from apartheid South Africa, flying over our heads. So this was the experience I had when I was growing up in Mozambique. And I was left with many friends, many colleagues, but we don't speak about this. And I think this is one of the problems that we really need to address in political terms when we are talking about the end, the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's not when we speak about the end of the communism, that's an European problem. But what did it mean for us in the South 
where all these connections were established, all these solidarities existed, and suddenly we start looking at the North as the only reference, as the only possible outcome of history. So I think we need to go back and to rethink the connections, the possibilities of learning among ourselves, and to recapture some of these reflections, because a lot of research, a lot of work has been carried out, and I think it helps to situate some of the reflections I'll be sharing with you. So I have my 45 minutes, so 10 minutes before you call my attention. Yes. Okay. So in order to start my conversation with you, I want to share with you some of two small stories. What, the first one is 19, April 1955. Some of us probably know what happened. The Bandung Conference, Indonesia, and especially the meaning of Bandung. Bandung was the first really conference where the colonized for the first time voiced their political will without the presence of the global north. And what is interesting, especially is the discourse of uh, the then president of Indonesia, Sukarno, that was addressing the conference underlining what colonialism and imperialism was about. And he named that difference, the line that separated, that he draws a line from Gibraltar up to the Sea of Japan, that he describes as the lifeline of imperialism. That is something that Boventura de Souza Sanchez has been theorizing as the abyss of thinking. And as Sukarno then called attention, and I think we still have to think about it today, the lifeline of imperialism is a line that separates the world into two territories. In one side, there are the Europeans, metropolitan spaces, and on the other side, there are the colonial territories where people are unfree and with their futures mortgaged to an alien political system. And that is the question I want to discuss, to share with you. Have we changed since 1955? Have we occupied the state? Have we challenged the law in reinventing sovereignty in our independent countries? How much have we inherited from this colonial legacy that is the modern nation state? Can we reinvent the state? to live with our expressions, with our knowledges, and with our experiences. Since the late 1990s, the scholarship on and colonialism has flourished and matured, as many of you know about it. And social-legal studies, many of which also conducted here at university, have called attention mainly in the field of sociology, anthropology, and history of the, on the importance of this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research about what means to be a nation, what is the, no, the, nation, the notion of the nation, and the connection between the nation and the state. Because they are two different projects that suddenly became together. But notwithstanding this richness and this diversity of discussions, there is something in common. Law has much to say about processes of colonialism and imperial expansion, revealing intensities of violence, forms of subjugation, language of, crit of critique, that circulated among these imperial subjects and the imperial authorities and colonial subjects alike. Therefore, the studies of law and colonialism reveal the contradictory objectives of colonial rule. And it's very interesting because they show the intended and unintended consequences of these laws and the force and fallibility of colonial power. So we need to look at these laws very carefully to understand how they change and how they were, but more importantly, these dynamics show the changes and continuities between the colonial time, the time when we were colonial objects, like it happened with me and especially my family, and the present, a structure that we really still live in, and how much of the nations that we have inherited really represent the diversity, the political, the cultural, and the social diversity we lived in. How much of other countries, of political structure of our countries, it has changed, and how much the notion of sovereignty that is associated with the project of nation state is adequate to answer to our claims. I try to address this project. First, I'll try to discuss, to present to you some of my thoughts about the problem, the colonial inheritance, the colonial legacy in the form of law. Later on, to show some of the possibilities and alternatives we can eventually benefit from listening to each other and learning to each other in terms of transnational scholarship on this topic. 
in order a little bit to transcend these binaries that sometimes we are caught in the colonizers and the colonized, the dominance and the resistance, the metropole and the colonial colonial context, because we need to make sense of all it all, and especially to become subjects of our destiny and not objects of, rep of political representation. And I think this is something that we really need to, need to think about. The second little story I wanted to talk to you about, it was inspired by a comment by, made by Eduardo Mondrian, some of you may know him. He was the first president of Front of Mozambique, uh, Front of Liberation of Mozambique. He was killed by the Portuguese in 1967, and, uh, in 1969, I'm sorry, but a couple of months before he was killed with a bomb, uh, he was interviewed for a newspaper and people asked him, so, what are you guys going to inherit from Portugal? What is going to be the relationship? And he said, we might have no chance to inherit anything from Portugal. And here I'm not going to go into details, but probably some of you know about the problems of African independence. That really this, the country that decided to stood against the colonial metropolis, such as being the case of Guinea Conakry, the French left, took everything they could, from the doors and the windows, to the roofs of the houses. So that was the problem that Mondrian was talking about because there was a war going on between that front and the Portuguese, and there was a, a strong risk that the Portuguese could take everything, preparing for the independence. But Mondrian then said, we have to start with whatever is available, and what is available is the state. We are going to inherit the state that the Portuguese left for us. And I think this request that we all share being in Latin America, being in the African context. It's a colonial bequest that we have to discuss in order to find paths towards decolonizing the separate universal, the modern nation state, and to identify what has been appropriated, what is useful, and what can be modified, counted hegemonically, to serve the cause of the oppressed by the combined that have been oppressed and exploited by the combined forces of capitalism, its evil twin, that is colonialism, and heteropatriarchy. In this sense, law is fundamental. In order to justify <coughs> colonial expansion and to maintain the racial and special differentiation and segregation between the colonizers and the colonized. And this has been analyzed very interestingly by Fanon, that described it, that line that separates the colonizer from the colonized as represented by the barracks and police stations. So whenever we have the barracks and police stations, we know there is a line that separates the the two worlds we lived in. A decade later, in the 1970s, Edward Said in Orientalism moved from this physical and corporeal experience of the abyssal line and the abyssal of, of the colonial violence to examine the epistemic violence of colonial encounter following a path that had been initiated in the early 20th century by Jose, well, Jose Martins, end of 19th century, but Du Bois, Sen, Lenin, Al Afghani, Maria Tegui, among many others. And if you really look carefully at modern law in the state, we'll see that the modern state did not evolve out of diplomacy, out of the United Nations. On the contrary, as many special theoretics from Latin America have shown, that it's the, the result of the violent 15th century New World territorial conquest in, that has been carried out by the Spanish and the Portuguese against indigenous populations, initiating first in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula, as you know, in al Andalus. That is the big question that we have to address, how the questions, the colonial project initiated in the southern part of Spain, or what is now Spain, and how it was later on exported to what, what became called as the New World and the historical and contemporary relationships between law, colonialism, and violence since then on have continued to be present. But quite often we have a problem. Because as I said in the beginning, we forgot and we tend not to look south-south, but we tend to look south-north. We always become the exception and the norm becomes the North Atlantic. And I'll try to talk a little bit methodologically about the problem of the North Atlantic when an exceptional location one, man, one location among, among so many others becomes the reference universal, and then we only think about, for comparative purposes, regarding the project developed in the North Atlantic. That is one of the problems. 
the project. It's not the only project. So we have to be careful about that part. But was law solely the domain of Europeans, as Fanon implied, or did it also materialize in the cultural and political practice of indigenous autochthonous communities? Many of the studies on legal pluralism have called attention that custom, what is now called customary law, that is the law of the others, that is not the modern law, were normative systems central to dispute resolution in many colonial societies, being it Mexico, Brazil, Angola, East Timor, or Mozambique. However, it did not hold the same degree of authority or jurisdiction as either the Spanish, Portuguese, or British, or the, the law of the Netherlands, or for the sake of where we are talking about, the German legal presence. As you know, Germany had lots of colonies in my region, Rwanda, Burundi, Togo, and so on, Cameroon. So we can talk about colonialism because we have not forgotten it and we were an object of colonial expansion. I, we were talking about it in the bags. Why did Portugal enter the First World War? Because it was attacked by Germany, as you know. But the attack occurred in Angola and Mozambique. That's how Portugal entered the First World War. Because there was an empire. Uh, Portugal entrou in en la Primera Guerra porque Portugal foi atacado mm -hmm. por Alemanha, mas foi em Moçambique e Angola. E a maioria dos mortos ocorreram em Moçambique. Mm -hmm. Vimos como cerca de 100 mil mortos mm -hmm. entre a tropa de Portugal, os blancos, e la, o exército africano, porque havia exércitos africanos. Então, já que ter atenção sobre o que significou para Portugal a entrada na Primeira Guerra. E o ataque foi alemão. Então, nós tuvimos Tanzania, Tanganyika, que era uma colônia de Inglaterra, que são os vizinhos de Angola. Então, há que recapturar a história. Ok, now back to, to English, otherwise they'll get mad at me. So, I, I think that we really need to, to pay attention to what legal pluralism is about, because quite often we have the formal state, the formal legal structure, the judicial, the state judicial system as the norm, and it's quite often the export of the so-called Romano-German system, and then we have on the other side of the legal pluralism, the indigenous law, the religious community laws, but these are all part of the structure of the interconnection generated in this process of violence imposed, initiated by the colonial conquest. So the multiple studies on legal pluralism that have been carried out in different colonial contexts, and they are very interesting, they show a common element. There is legal pluralism everywhere. So if legal pluralism is everywhere, how do we not theorize it as a condition of our contemporary reality? And how do we tend always to problematize this as a periphery problem, a problem of Bolivia, a problem of Mozambique, a problem of South Africa, a problem of Brazil, but not a problem of the world? Because it did, in theory, does not occur in the global world. Although it occurs, if you really pay attention to what is going on in United States and Canada and so on. Legal pluralism is also occurring, but it's a problem of how we think about it. So I, I, I think that is one of the things that we need to talk about. So law operated as a mode of coercion, a form of social transformation, and a discourse of power developed by dominant groups. And here I have to call your attention, it's an interesting question of the alliances between sometimes the oppressed, the oppressors and the oppressed. In the, in the reality of Southern Africa, the colonizers, male colonizers, will get allies in the form of colonized men to transform women into big children that needed to always have the permission of the husband to do whatever they want. And this is a colonial invention. It's quite interesting to analyze because it's projected in the law, in the so-called bank law in South Africa at the very end of the 19th century. So we can always claim this is a colonial construction. And that's how it is so important to analyze these questions. So these dualities that we have seen in the role and the rule of law as cycles of oppression and locus of resistance are the basis of the empirical insights and conceptual reasonings that we really need to start paying more attention. Um, if we really think about the places of resistance, we can never forget that many of our 
uh, leaders of the leaders of the movements of resistance and struggle against colonialism also used law, international forums to claim for the right to self-determination. And this is the way where law can play the role of emancipation movement. And that's how we, I think we need also to pay attention to the commission, committee of the 24, the committee of the colonization at United Nations that was headed by Bolivia until recently. That was the committee that struggled since the 1960 until 1980 for the right to self-determination in Africa that supported many of the independence that occurred in that stage. So most of the African countries became independent in that time. So that's how law can also play this role. But at the same time, we cannot erase the violence that law produced and law still produces nowadays. Therefore, the struggles against European legality and authority that were pursued by many colonial subjects often drew on the organization and juridical modes that were supposedly putative of Europe. So that was the big question, which form of legal structure are we going to use when we become independent? Are we still going to use the European legal structure we inherited? Are we going to reinvent this a new, or to use this all the different systems of justice present to create a synthesis, a creative synthesis of what united us? So this shows that these colonies were not just mere recipients of colonial law, but they also, the colonial subjects, they created a dialogue over law, over coercion, over violence. And in this sense, I think they were producing new forms of political and cultural authority that we also need to pay attention to. In thinking about these legal and political encounters, Mondlane, getting back to the interview, and many other political leaders, being it in Africa, in, in Asia, or Latin America, they thought to call our attention that it's fundamental not to forget the political roots that we share in our, in our diversity, that are part of what unites us as a global South, a claim for our political, ontological, and epistemological specificity, part of a much broader world, and it re requires the creation of dialogues to overcome the ab abyss that still stands between us. And quite often what we see is the use of the language of law as a universal that supposedly united us. But can we only use this universe, supposedly universal, or can we challenge this universal? One of the, the, the questions of this colonial, ex violent exercise of colonialism has been exploited by, explored by Suleiman Diagne. He has a very interesting. Uh, if I say any names that you are not very familiar with, just let me know because most of these books, I usually buy them, and now I was not supposed to have this on tape. Mm. Okay. I'll share it with you, because otherwise we're going to say that I'm against uh, copyrights, blah, 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 and I'll get into trouble. But there are lots of books that Kodejri and Klaxu, Kodejri is the African version of Klaxu. They have been producing and I have them, so if you are interested. But Suleiman Diagon has this very interesting uh, analysis of what universalism, the universalism of the Atlantic, North Atlantic, and this shows that it's a position of one who declares his own particularity uh, by saying, I have the particular to be universal, and that's what Europe did. I am so good that I'm different, so pay attention to me. And the problem is that we follow it. And especially don't pay attention to one of the key elements that many of the references that Enlightenment, European Enlightenment calls as its own production are indeed not a production of Europe. It's a set of inf knowledge, information, that was produced in the Global South. Later on, that was appropriated on, to use Jack Goody's idea, was stolen by you. So there is a question about who stole history. Just a small joke to show you that I'm not joking. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was involved in a discussion <coughs> Uh, in France with some colleagues of mine about the meaning of uh, the problems with uh, Islam in France and Islamophobia. And I was just, there was a moment when sometimes the discussions go in so many opposite directions that it's not possible to follow the discussion. 
And my colleagues were saying, no, we really need to get up, to get rid of all this interference, like Islam was an interference. And I was trying to explain that since Carlos Martel, they have been there. So that in the ninth century, it was the century that the African Muslims had occupied the what is now called Iberian Peninsula. So that history had to be told by other ways. There was no no way out. So I just said, okay, I give up. I accept your position. You are not just me, it was a group. Let's go back to your numbers because it's much easier to do a meta-analysis and so on using the Roman numbers because they are yours. And let's forget the Arab numbers because they are a big quest of the Arabic world. So let's go back. And especially let's avoid zero because zero it's an expression originated in the Inca culture, in the Maya culture, I'm sorry, in the Sanskrit world, and in Persia. So let's get rid of zero. And let's, you guys stay whatever is yours, and we survive and go. So these are the questions we have to be very good to know, as one of my professors once told me when I was about to leave the Soviet Union, uh, pay attention, you have to know very well their world, the first and second world, but specifically in order to claim a third world, you have to create bridges to argument and to be very careful about the way you develop the argument. So I, I think we need to be careful about the way we analyze this globalization because there are globalizations. It's not never in the, in the singular. And especially what is quite often people tell us is the globalization. It's one expression of the global context that history knows about it. So I think that uh, this, this methodological short note, many of the global, the notes that we have about the global are basically produced by or appropriated by this canon that is called Eurocentric knowledge. But I think it's in, the, in line probably with what uh, Valentin Moutim has called the colonial library that we are always going back to. Mm -hmm. But it's a time for us to challenge this knowledge and to construct other libraries, other archives, with other knowledges, oral and written. And that is the big challenge, to think from the South, with the South and about the South. And in line with what Wolf into the Sousa Sanchez has been calling, saying that the epistemological diversity of the world is endless, then we have to take that diversity into account when we are thinking about the state. And especially to claim that the modern state is a version of the state. It's not the only version of the state in history. Because that is the second element that I think that we need to pay attention, is to justify where this version of the state emerged and which problem it, what is it associated with. And uh, we need to be very careful that Indeed, what we call quite often Western, modern, Eurocentric knowledge, it's a prescriptive notion of a certain knowledge that confirms the modern capitalist and colonial world. And they say they exposed this was absolutely fundamental to export Europe when Europe was exporting the settlers to the colonies in order for them to feel at home. So it's quite normal for us to travel the world and we'll find the same post office, the same hospital, the same hotel, because this is the little Europe, say it talks about the sort of uh, structures and attitudes of reference that make sense for the settlers. In that sense, I think we need to travel, but to travel deeply, to travel inside ourselves, to find the diversity of our world beyond these references that they've being brought about by this Eurocentric attitude. This is a question that I think all over the world people have been talking about, and I think especially in the context of Latin America, Silvia Rivera Cusicanti has very interesting world, stressing the, how this Eurocentric concept permeates social sciences and what united us. We can be talking here because the concepts we all share are of Eurocentric metrics. The problem is, can we occupy these concepts? and give other meanings. And I think that is the second part of the talk that I want to talk to you about. The state we inherit is a colonial state, and I think there is no doubt about it. So this brings a question that what colonialism is about, the negation of the other as a subject, and the subject with knowledge has to be brought to the table. 
because we still insist in this representation that colonialism is just quite often we reduce it to racism, we reduce it to a form of violence we are not very knowledgeable about. But that's the line, it's when we are on the other side of the line and we are not considered as with values that matter for all the, of the world. And we are just considered with knowledge and relevance for that local. And that's it. We are not local. We are all global. And that is the challenge that we need to bring into the, dis the discussion. And the second element is to criticize the colonial history that always puts us in that side of the history. And what is interesting in this part of the history is how this history creates us especially with uh, a reference that we don't belong to it. It's like we are fit to dress a t-shirt that does not belong to us and is going to transform me into something else. And I think uh, in that sense it's really interesting to, to read and to comprehend the moments of this possession, that this imposition of another narrative upon ourselves as because we really do not identify ourselves quite often with the representation that exists. For instance, uh, in our case, the case of <coughs> Africa, it's like Africa. In Africa, there is. What is Africa? We are 55 countries. We start in Ceuta and we end in South Africa. What the heck is Africa? How can we talk about a continent as it were a country? How can I talk about Latin America? Mm. It's the mirror image. How can I speak about a uniform? Of course, we share elements, the colonial past, the negation of history. But what is our contribution? Besides negation, what is our contribution? And I think one of the problems we have is always enter history against the tide of history. Because we are there, because we are outside history, because we really do not belong. The question is, how can we become objects of our history and can analyze our past as a project for the future? And this is an element that I think it's very important in order to combine modern elements that we all share, individual, individuality, individual rights, respect for private property, uh, rule of law, free market, and so on, but also the collective moments, community property, which is not really property, it's community sharing of land, because those are the elements that are still present there and still matter. And that's how we still survive. So these are not elements of the past, but are elements that really characterize us. And this brings the question, how can we organize justice? How can we think about justice if justice is not one, but justice is plural? And I'm just looking at justice because it's the field I've been doing most of my research. But it's not just a question of justice. It's a question about health. How many health systems do we have? And just to shift to, to justice, I do a lot of research on witchcraft accusations. We have lots of witchcraft accusations. And if you want, I can talk to you about what are the implications. But basically, a spirit cannot enter a court of law because the spirit cannot be visible. So the judge, first thing, is going to ask, did you see it? No. So, case dismissed. But witchcraft enters all, every week, I have to sit in a hearing that involves witchcraft. And just to tell you a story, just not to think that I'm daydreaming. Um, I was uh, some years ago in the north, in a first level court, uh, district court, and there was this case, that there is this idea of spirit of Mpondor, Mpondor is the lion, that when there are the big storms, the, the lion comes and becomes the force. So this guy comes and says, well, I am the Mpondor, I am the traditional healer. It's not healer, it's the force, the, I have the forces of the ancestors with me and I killed four cows last night of my neighbor because I am the spirit. So here I am, I'm handling myself to the court to be penalized because I killed. And he was like, we can't have killed because it's a lion. We saw the lion. The lion was there. But the guy insisted that he was the spirit of Mpondo. 
So basically, we were saying, no, this is a case not for the court, this is a case more for the national parks and so on, because there is a case between cows and lions. But we had to sit together outside the court because the judge was very flexible. Of course, it was not a legal case, but we had to hear all parts and come to a conclusion because it mattered to the people to redeed the collective because the collective is more important than the individual. And that is one of the key elements where the legal structure does not match. In the modern legal trajectory, people are seen as individuals. In most of what is called now customary law or the other legal structures, the community is more important than the individual. That is the first element. And the second element that is very important, two parts can come to court to put a claim, and the two parts can be both penalized in the argument. So it's quite normal to have someone saying, okay, I have a case because, okay, I stole the bicycle of that person. Someone says that I stole the bicycle. Okay, I I'm going to tell the story that happened with me, not to invent stories. So I was doing my PhD, so it was a while ago, and I, want, I was interested to know how many fruits of a certain tree that is very important uh, a tree could, uh, could yield. So I decided to look at the tree that supposedly my wild imagination did not belong to anyone, and I chopped a lot of branches to count how many fruits. And then I disappeared for a month to do my research in the lab and I came back. When I came back, people said, there is a case against you in the court. You have to go to community court. And I was like, a case against me? I didn't do anything. Yes, you did. And then I went to court. I sat in court for one day and I had to tell the story that what I was doing. And it, it was actually my mistake. It never happens that a tree that yields fruits does not belong to a community or a person. A tree that gives fruits always belongs to somebody, and somebody knows the value of the tree. It was my mistake. And, but people said, well, it was your problem. But indeed, it was also our problem, because we did not explain to you how we work here. So I was penalized. I had to clean the patio in front of the court for two days. And believe me, everybody was there staring and giving instructions, clean better here, clean better there. I did. It was to see if I would comply with the rules of the court because I was studying the courts. But at the same time, what was it very interesting was that the administrator was also penalized. He had to clean with me because he failed to instruct me about the meaning of the trees in that region. And that is something that would never happen in a formal court of law. So I think that those are the elements that I think we need to take into consideration because they are very important. And the, the, last, moment, the last element of, from this course that I think are very important is the form they allow us to, to apprehend and understand the social struggles, the, the connect, interconnectivities, political, cultural, and familiar among people because we listen to stories with three, four, five generations. So we understand through these struggles how the community is constructed and which are the main problems that comfort that region. So I think that that was a very interesting element that brought to my sense the idea about legal pluralism and especially the question I want to talk about uh, what sovereignty is about. Sovereignty is that idea that there is an institution, the modern state, that is the sovereign power to represent and to be the custodian of the people that fell under that state. But that, in context of legal pluralism, of cultural plurality, it raises a question. Is health, justice, education monocultural? in our context, or do we share diversity inside? Because most of our countries are multicultural countries, how can we apprehend this diversity and challenge this very strict notion of sovereignty that only allows for one culture to be represented by the state? How can we open the space for this other cultural diversity? In many countries like mine, and 
now I'm going to explain why I refused to speak in Berlin. In, in 1884-85, as you all know, took place the Berlin Conference, right? Have you ever heard about it? Mm, yeah. It was a conference convened in Germany in, to divide Africa. So it was the beginning of the split of the continent and the modern borders that we have today. So as a result, different states were separated, different cultures were separated, like uh, the group I belong to, my mother language, Shanghai, are separate, split between what is now Swaziland, South Africa, and Mozambique. And the result is that we are nations divided by the colonial structure. So we, in my country, we have uh, 14, 15 national languages, meaning different legal structures, plus the religious. We have Sharia also in the country. So all this diversity has to be present in the legal structure for us to understand what is at stake and to negotiate constantly what goes for all and what creates problems for the majority. Because legal pluralism is not always a very good thing, quite often it negates the rights of different groups. So this idea of legal pluralism shows clearly and it's not just the case of Africa, it also happens in Ecuador, in Bolivia, and in Mexico, that sovereign power is not inevitably associated with the capacity to bear rights. And when we analyze carefully this colonial intervention, the negation of the others with rights to apply, with forms of conflict resolution that could apply to all of them, we see the creation of non-beings that are going to justify the violence of imposition of this idea of one rule to all of us. So the question is between equity and the right to difference. How can we make, mix the two together? And the second element we have to pay attention is that why have we insisted in this idea that the modern state is the best form to address our problems? And how can we have, even in contexts like Mozambique, which states very clear in Article 4 of the Constitution that we are a multicultural country, or like the Constitution of Bolivia or Ecuador that recognizes the plurinational state, we don't have in the Supreme Court indigenous just, judges, justices. How can we have a constitutional court that don't have justices that are indigenous? Or can we have a constitutional court when the constitution is per se monocultural. What is a constitution? Are constitu can constitutions be an example or a possibility of addressing other stories, other legal structures that we listen to when we are listening to these stories in the local level, in these other forms of conflict resolution? And this is the big quest that Mondrian talked about, and I think it's the big quest we will share. It's the problem how to address diversity in Yerit by this division between modern law inherited by the colonial from the colonial administration and all the other legal systems that remain with local effect, not part of the official legal structure all the way up as it was supposed to be. So this brings us to the question of what sovereignty can be and how can we address possibilities of decolonizing the idea of nation state and the nation state is in crisis all over the world it's not just in africa it's everywhere here in europe you see it very clearly in different contexts but we need to start understanding how many of the representations that we still have are an invention of the colonial project and just to give you an example from my previous i was a long time ago, I was trained as in the US as an anthropologist. And going to work in Mozambique, in Kenya, in South Africa, in Somalia, we clearly understand that one of the implications of being of this anthropological gaze upon Africa is the reduction of Africans to ethnic entities. We don't have class, we don't have generational struggles. There are no workers in Africa. Eventually, there are some peasants, but no class. Class, it's a patrimony 
of the North Atlantic, all over the world, we don't pay attention to this. So, the other element is this invention of ethnic groups that then were called tribes, now are called in a more civilized way, ethnic groups. But are we so close in those groups? How can we explain that Europeans were changing ambassadors with many African countries until the Berlin Conference and all of a sudden we became tribes with no rule? Why the silence about this not so long ago history? It's because exactly the idea that there was a need to legitimize colonialism and to legitimize this export of this violence in the name of ruling because they are unruly. And the two elements that are going to be used are education and the need to teach people to work. And these two elements were fundamental to appropriate land. So I could go on about how the, mecha the legal mechanism is very useful to apprehend the essence of colonialism. But colonialism in our context, especially in settlers' colonies, that are many of them in Africa, is to apprehend land and to transform the inhabitants of those lands to grasp the land and to transform them into people that don't know how to work and need to be taught to work in those lands. So if you read many of the um, documents produced up to the Second World War, you'll see lots of claims about conditions analogous to slavery that are going to be the conditions applied to Africans with the goal of teaching them how to work. So that was the condition, and Africans were never citizens. So legally, there was this idea that because they were objects of interference, they could not be subjects of rights. So we established clearly a line where on one side, now I'm talking about African context, there were the colonizers, the citizens, and on the other side, there were the indigenous with no rights. So in an African context, be aware that to ask someone if it's in, he or she is indigenous, it's a derogative comment. It means that she's not civilized. Because that was how the law was structured. And this law, in the case of Portugal, was abolished formally in 1961 with the beginning of the armed struggle in Angola. So it's not that long ago my grandmother was born an indigenous and that to apply to be a citizen legally. So these are the elements that I think we need to study and we need to, to understand how the subjects had to struggle to enter the idea of citizenship. So permanently what you'll see is that colonies is this idea of misappropriation. We have to apply to be citizens and to enter that model to which we do not belong. And this, this hierarchy of values that formally or informally is prescribed to us as the scale to enter a more developed or less developed state is full of disappropriation and full of violence, epistemic violence, that I think we need to pay attention and it's very important to analyze. So my question now is <coughs> to think about sovereignty and to think which conditions could have been used or applied in order to save or to rescue some of ideas. One of the important readings for me right now is the, the work of M. S. Cesaire and Leopold Senghor when they sought to claim that decolonization was not about keeping like, the, the colonies as nation states, but about all, well, about the renegotiation of or the rearranging of the nature of the connections between the colonizers and the colonized, among the colonized, and the allocation of power in these relationships. This was the project of Senghor and Césaire, and I, think for, and I understand why in the 50s this was not a well-received idea, but I think we need to go back to this idea, because the nation state, the big quest left to us, it's a wrong, it's a wrong thing, big quest that we need to, to overstep. And together, Cesare and Singor, they thought they aim not only to abolish the co colonialism, but to overcome the traditional notion of sovereign and unified national states. 
They hope to invent a new political form for a different world order. They, their ultimate belief was that decolonization might not require national independence and that self-determination might not require a state sovereignty. It was above all about self-identification and self-proclamation outside the borders of the invasion of the nation state. And in this sense, I think it's interesting to look at what people in the US have been working, especially in the, the First Nations in the US and Canada, because they are claiming that sovereignty is both about autonomy from neocolonial interference and about, and about this possibility of interdependence, to move away from interdependency, from obligation, and to move more towards reciprocity among peoples and among communities. And by freeing and rethinking, rethinking the agency of the colonized as subjects of their history, not objects of political of policies of the state, I think we have possibilities to open up the meaning of what it means to be sovereign. Not that I'm against the state. I think that more than ever we need the state. We need the state to organize ourselves, but the state where we identify ourselves with the state and with these different dimensions that I've been talking about to be part of it. Therefore, to question sovereignty is to question the hegemonic narrative about the modern nation state. And this critical line of inquiry implies the identification of why we did it, why do we need to challenge the state, it means that we need to go back to the core idea of where we came from and to move towards meaningful alternatives that are in the world. To finalize my question, I think, and I, I, I was, when I was thinking about what can we do, because this really talks to us, how can we overstep cognitive injustice that it was characterizes us nowadays? How can we develop a, a roadmap towards a stronger citizenship that can be collective, can be individual, combined, that stands against all colonial pacifications, against injustice and inequalities, what can be done? What can we do in the South to think about it? And uh, I think that one of the, the ideas that comes to my mind, one of the first of them is the problem of the university, because the university is the continuation of the, the North Atlantic that is the first problem because it's an appropriation by a certain location of the world of experiments about learning in the world uh, i'm glad to be part of a continent where the oldest university still in functioning is present a university that was founded by women in nine, 946 in fetch that's nowadays in morocco but it's the oldest university in the world and it's not a Bonapartian or a Baltian university. It's not a modern university. It's another university, but it's a university. So the problem is, again, when Europe appropriates the concept and transforms the concept into its own. So I think we need to open a university towards other knowledges, other experience, and to challenge and discuss, which means reducing ourselves as not the experts, but one more part of the discussion with leadership, local leaderships, community leaderships, with local judges and so on. That are really important part of what we are. But mo most of all, I think we need to rethink our connections, connections across the South, learn with the South and for the South. And in this sense, sovereignty emerges as autonomy from the neocolonial interference that's still persistent today. And as a form of feeling, militant interdependency, and uh, an attempt to accost sovereignty between the first and the third world, because I think that is what we need today. And I think this, many of these demands are on the table, and we share them. We share them in terms of reparations. We share them in migration as the colonization, the migration across the Mediterranean Sea, it's very similar to the problem that we are now seeing between Mexico and the US, and that united us in the South. Uh, the legitimate the claim for the people to explain where the money is going from, because we are always accused of being corrupt. When there is a corrupt, there is a corrupter. 
So can we make the tra international trans transaction more transparent? Can we know where the money is going to? Can we ask for the restitution of artwork and other priceless plunders, such as the national archives? For us, it's very complicated because the archives are in Portugal and kept in India, and some of them in Seville, because for a while Portugal was a colony of Spain. But it's really bizarre. If any of us wants to study the colonial past, we have all to go to Seville, where our knowledge is kept. We need to reclaim that part. And alternative governance visions altogether. And I think learning from the experiences, and I've been using a weird expression, I had the pleasure to have been part of different uh, meeting points and discussions about political futures. And I think the colonization in the sense that Fanon calls to us about the disappearance of colonialism and colonizers and colonized is a breaking up about the references that we use to see a future for ourselves. So I think we need to find a future not just in the figure of modern state, but in Summa Causae, that is a, a reference that we need to discuss constructively. What can we learn from it? In Wasabiya, in many of the Arab-speaking world, or in my region about Ubuntu, the meaning that we, I am because we are, and we are because we are human beings, and we're human beings related to the nature. So I think the diversity of experiences, of political experience in the world, is endless. The problem is that we are framed with this very strong force of political science that insists in teaching us there is nothing else besides the modern nation state. And I think there is. So thank you very much for your attention, your patience, and for tomorrow minutes.